As you may have gathered, Texas was a wild and woolly place in the 1930s. Uh, the weather seemed to be conspiring with the gangsters and the outlaws and the Fergusons to create kind of a strange melange of um, weirdness in Texas. Uh, well, 1934, that ship starts to turn around. Bonnie and Clyde, for instance, are killed in northern Louisiana and uh, ambushed by none other than one of the fired Texas Rangers, Frank Hamer. Uh, Frank Hamer set up an ambush, gunned them down, put their bodies on display. Now, Bonnie and Clyde were Texans. Bonnie uh, was from a little town near Ballinger, and uh, Clyde Barrow was from Oak Cliff. And so these two Texas outlaws meet a Texas outlaw's fate and are put on display before they're buried in their, near their families in uh, the Metroplex. Uh, it's really Governor uh, Jimmy Allred that begins to erase the Ferguson legacy in not, when he's elected in 1934. Uh, Ma Ferguson, to her credit, uh, said that she would not serve more than one term, and um, when she leaves, Allred takes over and uh, essentially rebuilds the Texas Rangers by moving them into the Department of Public Safety where they are today. And so the reputation of the Rangers are, is being rehabilitated during the latter part of the 1930s. Uh, there's another guy that begins to make his uh, uh, way onto the scene in the 1930s. Lyndon Baines Johnson enters Congress during this same decade. Well, as Johnson is in, entering Congress and Texans are running the federal government in essence, uh, there's a lot of federal dollars that flow into Texas. Mostly it comes in the form of uh, a number of the work relief uh, initiatives. Uh, the Civilian Conservation Corps is especially well represented in Texas. There's 27 camps across the state. But there's also a lot of projects that are taken on by the Works Progress Administration, the WPA. Uh, there's other um, uh, projects done by the Public Works Administration, the PWA. And there's also quite a number of uh, National Youth Administration camps and programs across the state. And the National Youth uh, Administration is run by Texas. Well, while that's going on, Texans are looking for something that can kind of buoy everybody's spirit and tell everybody that, you know, Texans have a lot of grit and determination. We'll get through this. Well, what better than a big 100-year birthday party? It's the Texas Centennial coming up in 1936. And so various cities begin to buy for who will host it. Uh, they're asked to uh, put in bids. And San Antonio kind of put in a lackluster bid. They were not particularly interested. Houston put forward a pretty strong bid, but Dallas's was over the top. And so Dallas is awarded the uh, coveted uh, position of being the host of the Texas Centennial Celebration. Uh, they go out to Fair Park and transform it and say this will, in fact, be the headquarters for the great celebration coming up in 36. What happens in 1936? is that Texas in Dallas rediscovers its Texasness. And it's really a result of the centennial that Texas national identity gets supercharged in the 20th century. Well, as you can imagine, Texans are not necessarily going to go along with national trends if they seem to violate some of their conservative principles. So when uh, FDR is seen to be overreaching, for instance, the Supreme Court packing case in which he tries to uh, expand the number of Supreme Court justices from 9 to 15 so that he can then get the votes he needs on that bench to allow for some of his additional uh, government intervention into the economy. When that court packing scheme is launched, Texans tend to oppose him. Well, he's got a way to exact revenge. In the midterm elections in 1938, Roosevelt makes sure that Texans have their wings clipped. And all of a sudden, Texas influence at the federal level begins to wane for a while. Well, what goes on back in Texas as the uh, national uh, politics, the winds start to blow against Texas? Well, in the state, and especially hard on the heels of the exuberance of the centennial, 
you have a new politician that comes on the scene. Uh, this guy is a phenomenal. His given name is Wilbert Leo Daniel, but everybody knows him as Pappy. That's Pappy Leo Daniel, uh, or Pass the Biscuits O'Daniel. See, he was a, well, he was a radio personality. Uh, this guy essentially was uh, a star of what passed for social media back then, except it was real one-way social media because he came into your living room through the radio, brought all sorts of great new music, including Western Swing, which is starting to evolve at that time period. And uh, he was a celebrity. And pretty soon his listening audience said, look, uh, Pappy, why don't you run for governor? Now, what? Well, here's where the biscuits come in. His main sponsors were a flower company. And so um, he <laughs> had this sort of common touch because everybody uses flour. Uh, his band was called the Light Crust Doughboys. It's Light Crust Flour. And so he has this sort of real common touch thing going for him. And his audience says, come on, run for governor. And in fact, he's drafted into politics. Well, he's just the guy for conservative Democrats at that time. Uh, conservative Democrats in Texas, some of whom called themselves Jeffersonian Democrats, uh, said, you know, here's a guy with a lot of popular appeal that we can probably control once he's in uh, the governorship. And in 1940, <laughs> Pappy Leo Daniel gets in to the state house down in Austin. Um, later on, Pappy Leo Daniel will actually beat LBJ for a Senate seat during a special election. This guy is a political phenomena in a time when Texas is undergoing kind of a strange series of phenomena.